Hello and welcome to our lecture on uh, web services. These slides are copyright Creative Commons attribution and what we've been playing with uh, in chapter 12 was the basic idea of using HTTP or the REST request response cycle to send data to a send a request to a server and get something back. Uh, when we looked at HTML, we parsed it, we took out tags. So we're kind of starting to treat this as data. And in web services, we really are switching to let's produce this data as data with the intent to have it consumed by an application as data. And basically in doing this, we have to come up with a format for the document that comes back when we ask for the for the data so that we can parse it and make sense of that data. And there are two commonly used formats for that data that we'll take a look at both of them. And so if you sort of imagine the problem of exchanging data between, between two applications, we have to deal with the fact that these applications may not be the same language. One might be Python. You might have some data in a Python dictionary and we might want to send it into Java. And Java doesn't have Python dictionaries, it has hash maps. And so we have to agree on a format. And that is the format that we convert the data from the Python dictionary. We do some kind of conversion, we send it across the network, and then we sort of parse it and interpret it, and then come up with an internal structure within the, the other system, right? And so we call this a wire format, a format that is on the wire. It's not always a wire, but we call it a wire format. And so we can agree. One of the formats that's commonly used that we'll talk about is called XML. And XML consists of less thans and greater thans. It looks a lot like HTML. That's because they both were inspired by an earlier thing called SGML. And so we call the act of taking something from an internal format and sending it, making it into a wire format, the act of serialization, and then reading a wire format, and then getting it back into some internal format in some destination system and some destination language, we call that deserialization. And XML is one of the two formats that we're going to talk about today. The other is JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. And so the difference with JSON is in its choice of how to represent the data on the wire, it uses curly braces, colons, and, and, and square brackets, which are not in this particular example. And so these are just two techniques for serializing and deserializing data. Two techniques. They're the two ones that are the most common, and we will talk about them, both of them, in the class. So we'll start talking about XML. And so the first thing to observe about XML is that um, these tags, much like in HTML, they have start tags and end tags. So people slash people. This is called an element. We might also call it a node. And then within a node, there are other nodes. And so within the people node, here's one person, and then here's another person. There, and this one starts with person and ends with slash person. And then within the person element, there's a name element and a phone number element. So elements within elements within elements. In the term that we'll use for this is simple element and complex element. And the basic difference between them is a simple element is one that has no sub-elements. It is just like the end. It's just the name, Chuck. There's no other elements inside of it. And a complex element is like people or like person that has more elements within it. So complex elements constructed of uh, uh, element has elements within it as well as data. So let's talk a little bit about XML. Now there's a debate as to which is better, XML or JSON. And the answer is they're, they're probably better for different applications. XML is really good at representing hierarchical structured data that needs a lot of description. And it was a started from this thing called SGML, which was a generalized markup language using less than and greater than, but it was intended to be a little more easily legible. And so it's, it's commonly used to do things like word processing documents or whatever. So as I mentioned, uh, XML has start tags and end tags. Um, name and slash name is also a start and an end tag. And then it has some text content. The text is 
that which is between the start and end tag that's not itself another element. So the, this phone number is a text, a bit of text element. <clears throat> In addition to the text element, which is between the start and end tags, there is also the notion of an attribute. And an attribute is on the start tag. If in the case of email here, it's a self-closing tag. Type is their set of key value pairs. Type equals and then the value in double quotes. Okay, so height equals yes. And type is international. Those are called attributes. So we have start tags, end tags, content, attributes, and self-closing tags are the ones that Self-closing tags are the ones that don't have slash email. They just end in slash, and they're totally self-contained, but they can have attributes on them, if you like. So white space doesn't matter in general. It's, uh, we tend to format these with little bits of indentation to make our lives easier. And so these two, these two representations that I have here are uh, roughly the same. Uh, and the fact that I've got these uh, nicely indented uh, makes no difference. So line ends don't matter, and it's generally discarded on text elements. And we indent only to be readable, and it's very common to indent to be readable. So here's just a bit of XML from an example. Give you some. So we have a, a recipe tag, and everything's going to be closed. Recipe tag. The recipe hat tag has a number of attributes on it. Again, they're key value pairs. Name equals bread, pep time equals five minutes, cook time, three hours, etc. Your title tag, an ingredient tag. Flour is the text bit of this ingredient tag, and then it has some attributes, some more ingredients, some instructions, a step tag, and an end step tag. You kind of get the picture, right? So we can represent lots of things. And in and, and XML, one of its advantages and disadvantages, the disadvantage is kind of wordy. The advantage is it's a little more self-describing than JSON is. JSON um, is, is sort of simpler and more direct, but uh, uh, XML is, is in some ways more self-describing because we can kind of look at this and based on the names, ingredient, instructions, step, they can make some sense to us. So tags are the basic less than, greater than bits that the indicate the beginning and ending of elements. Attributes are key value pairs on open tags. And serializing and deserializing is this act of taking an internal structure inside of a Python program and producing the less thans and greater thans in the right proper format so they can be sent across the internet to the destination. So one of the ways we can think of XML as we have these complex elements that have more complex or simple elements is we can think of them as nodes in a tree. Another name for this little B guy, B slash B, is as a tree, as a node in a tree. And so we can think of the B as this node in a tree. Its parent node is A. It's part of A. Its immediate sort of containing element is A. C, its immediate containing element is also A. It's a node. And C has two child nodes. So when we think about a node like C, we think of A as the parent node, and then the child node and the child node, right? So, so this is like a tree, or these are more moving down toward leaves, and these are sort of the trunk. It's a bit of an upside down tree, if you think about how trees actually grow. Now, we often think of the text bits that are sitting in here as the children of a node. So the, clear that. So D, had, D is part of C, its immediate parent is C, and its child is that text bit Y. Okay? And so that's one way to think about XML as, as a tree. And, and as we start pulling stuff out of XML, we'll go grab a node and then we'll say, oh, let's, let's go through the, child, the immediate children of that particular node. Or I'll grab a node and I'll find the, uh, the text child of that node. And so we tend to sort of pull our way through these things in trees thinking about I am at a node and I'm looking down from that node. And, and so that's the tree terminology, the node terminology. Another way to think about this, <coughs> if the, I mean, sorry, the, the attributes are also best thought of as sort of associated with the node is kind of children. So this W attribute is like a child of the B node. The B node is this whole thing. 
it has a child of the text bit and a child that is the attribute. Another way to think about this is as paths. And the way the paths work is you just take a how to find this text X. Well, it's really the child of B, which is the child of A. And then we use sort of a slash notation like we might use for folders on a file system. Slash A slash B is where in this tree. So slash A slash B is where we would find X. And slash A slash C slash D is where we would find Y. <clears throat> slash A slash C slash E is where we find E. So these are the paths to pieces of the document. That's another way that we think about them, starting with sort of this outer, outer node, A, and then sort of working in as far as we have to go. So that's basic XML. Another thing that we often use in XML is a technology called XML Schema. And XML Schema defines a contract that tells us what legal XML really is. And so it itself turns out to be XML, but its purpose is, is to describe a set of XML documents that can pass the schema. So, the, so it's a set of constraints on the structure, what the name of the tags are, how many of the tags you can have, what tag lives inside of what other tag, etc. And the goal of a schema is to use a schema to validate, to look at some XML and, says that, and say that is legal XML or that is not legal XML based on the schema that we've got. So the validation step is it takes a XML document that we're wondering if it complies with the schema we take a schema and we hand it to this piece of software called a validator. And the validator either says, yes, it's validated, or no, it's not validated. The real value in this is if we have two applications, they are going to exchange data, they should be able to come up with a contract as to what is valid and invalid. An XML schema is a good way to describe valid and invalid XML. So here is a very simple example of XML schema in action. So here's an XML document. It's got a person with a last name, an age, and a date born. Okay? And so here's an XML schema contract. And I mentioned it was XML. So it's got less thans and greater thans, and it's got tags. It's got attributes. And so what it's really saying here is that, that the outer part of the XML is supposed to be a tag by the name of person. That says the outer thing. And then within that, there is a sequence. And there's supposed to be an element that's last name with a type of string, an element age that's a type of integer, and an element called date born, which is a type date. And so we can sort of know that these are the proper names for these things. And this is supposed to be a string, this is supposed to be a number, and that's supposed to be a date. So we can look at that, look at the two documents. A possible bit of XML that either complies or doesn't comply, a contract that tells us whether or not or what the, what the contract is, and then a validator that sort of mechanically checks to see if the XML meets the contract or not. So there's a number of different XML languages, schema definition languages. We're talking about one called the W3C XML schema often ends up with a file suffix on your file system of XSD. So I won't talk about the other ones. I'm talking about A, the most common one, and probably the easiest one to understand. And that probably is a reason why it's probably the most common one. So we're going to focus, focus on the schema that came from the World Wide Web Consortium. Like I said, the file names tend to end in XSD. So this one we went through before. Person is a complex type, so we say it's a complex type with a, name, with a tag name of person. Then within that, there's a sequence of tags. That XS sequence says you can expect a series of tags. A simple element, a non-complex element, is just an XS element. And then we have the name and the expected type for the three elements, and this particular one validates nicely. There's a couple other things that we can put on as the XSD uh, starts to become uh, richer. Uh, I mean, th there are more things that you can describe. Uh, in this example, we are seeing 
the use of min occurs and max occurs. And that basically is a constraint on the cardinality of these things. And so what this is saying is that we have a tag called full name. It is a string and it's required, meaning that the minimum number of occurs, it occurs is one and the maximum number of, occurs of, of times it has to occur is one. So that means it's exactly one. And so we have that. If we look at this child name tag, like this one here, we have four of them. It says it's a string and the minimum number of times we should have it is zero and the maximum number of times we're allowed to have it is 10. So we're allowed to have this tag repeated between zero and 10 times. And in this particular example, it is repeated exactly four times. And so that validates. That is a happy validation. That looks like kind of a mean validation. So let's change it to be a happy validation. So it reads this, reads this, reads those two things, and it's happy because it meets the validation. Having trouble drawing happy faces. Just a few more data types to talk about in this XML schema. My goal is not to have you be able to write XML schema. I'm just kind of showing you a little bit of it so that you can understand how it works um, and maybe look at a simple one and understand how and understand it makes sense and, and ask your questions. Does this meet it or not? So we have that we talked about string. I will talk about in a second the date format. Date format is generally year, month, day. Uh, there is a date time, which is year, month, day, the letter T, hour, minute, second, and then optional time zone. You can have decimal numbers, which means they have um, uh, you know, points after the decimal place, and you can even say integers. And so you can have some types of things that we can put in a schema to constrain the data that we see in the XML. So I mentioned the date time format. There's a special standard called ISO 8601 that talks about this date time format. It is, it's, I like this format because it is easily sortable because the, the top part is the year and it's always the same number. You put zeros in year, month, day, then the letter T, then hour, minute, second, and then the time zone most common time zone that we tend to use is a time zone called Z. Normally this would be like GMT or EDT for Eastern Daylight Time or EST. Most computers don't like using that. Most computers want to use a time that is the same around the world. And so they tend to use Greenwich Mean Time, otherwise known as Zulu Time. And so you might have a local time on the East Coast I don't even know what these numbers are, but let's say it's uh, 10 o'clock at night. That's, that's a bad time to pick. Let's see. Let's pick like 2 p.m. in the U.S. East Coast. Well, in England, I think it's six hours later, it's actually 8 p.m. in the U.K. This is Zulu time. Greenwich Mean Time, Universal Time, Zulu Time, are all the same thing. They are the time in the UK. And again, if if you want to see something happen an hour ago or two hours ago, you don't want to have to calculate back and forth between lots of time zones. So we really prefer to, to use this Zulu time and map the stuff that we store as we send data from server to server, which might be in different time zones. So we tend to use Zulu time, otherwise known as Greenwich Mean Time. Here's another example of some XML schema. Um, and this is most, most of this is pretty much the same. Yada yada, we got some min occurs here. Um, we got strings, string, string. And now we have this thing called country. And it is a simple type. And it's a string, but this excess enumeration gives us the legal values. So it's not just any string, it's got to be F, R, D, E, E, S, U, K, or U, S. And so if you're validating this XML for country, you look at the string and check to see if it's a member of that set. So again, that's another kind of thing that you can do with XML schema.
Here's another example of some XML schema. Let's see, we've seen most of this. XML complex type, XS sequence, a string, complex type, sequence, string, 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 string. Uh, this one, max occurs unbounded. That means you can have an infinite number of these things. String, min occurs zero. Uh, XS positive integer. So this is this means that negative 14 would not be allowed. Decibel we've talked about, oh, u equals required, that means it must be there. So this just gives you a sense, and I'm not going to expect you to know all these, but just I'll give you a couple of questions that are relatively straightforward on these. Just a sense of, you know, take a look at some XML and see if that XML meets it or not. Okay. So we're not going to spend a lot of time in Python. Um, uh, doing too much with XML, we're going to do most of the stuff in Python and JSON, but this is just a little bit of XML code that you can download from the website that there is an XML parser built into Python and it's called element tree. There are actually several ones that you could use and I'm just going to use the one called element tree. So I'm making a data, a triple quoted string, so here's my little XML bit and it's just sort of some well-formed XML, the stuff we've been playing with before. So this import statement gets us the element tree library. And to parse this data, we do et from string and pass in the string. This is a string. Now let's talk about what tree looks like. Well, tree is, again, we could think of this as either nodes or, or uh, paths. There's a person node, then there is a name, then there's a phone, then there's an email. And name has uh, Chuck underneath it. Uh, phone has the, the number and an attribute underneath it. And email has an attribute under it. And these are nodes. I probably should have made a better slide for this. And so what we do is we find our way to a node. So tree is all of this. Okay, so tree is person on down. So I can say tree dot find the name thing. So what that does is that goes and finds this guy. Tree dot find. So go in the whole tree and find the thing called name and give me the text element in it. So that is going to print out Chuck. Tree.find email finds this little guy. Or another way to say it is it finds this little guy. And then it says get the attribute hide. And so this is going to print out the string yes. Okay, so that prints out the string yes. So tree is all of that. Find the name thing, so that's the name guy. Find the name, find name. Dot text, well that is this text right here. Then tree dot find a dot email, well that's this whole thing. And then that within that, to get the attributes, you use dot get and then the name of the attribute. And so that's going to give me back the string yes. So this will print out Chuck and yes. So you basically go down this tree, you go find pieces, and then you pull pieces out of those pieces so you can parse this uh, from a tree. Okay. Here's another example of a little bit of XML. And so the difference between this XML and the previous XML is we have another tag called stuff and then there is a tag called, um, oh, this is not in indented all so well, there is a users tag and then there within that are two users. So the difference between the previous one is we just went down a set of nodes. Now what we have is we have a, a stuff, users, and then we have a series of users and there could be several of these. 
So you could think of this as in here, there's dot, 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 dot. There's, there could be hundreds of users. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, I would like to do find all, find all these users, not just find one, but find all the users. Stuff is, we parse it, and then we do a find all of user slash user, users slash user, and that's find me all the user nodes. Let me change color here. Find me all the user nodes underneath users. And so that gets me all of these. And I get this back as a list. And in the list is each of the nodes. In my example, I'm only going to get a list of two nodes, but I'm going to see uh, if there's hundreds, I would get hundreds. So the thing I get back from stuff.findall is a list of nodes. And there's stuff under here as well. Right? Each of these nodes has things underneath of it. So stuff find all users slash users gets me a list of all of the user objects. And because list is a, LST is a list, I can see how many things that I've got. And then I write a little loop for item in list. And that's going to make an iteration variable item is going to go through the successive elements of this list. And then item is a node. So each item, we're getting a, little, getting a little complex here. Each item, let me switch over here. Another way to say this is list find all gets a list of all of the user objects. And there turns out to be two of them. So there's a, here's the, here's the sub zero and here's the sub one in the list. We get a list of user objects. Then we're going to have this iteration variable item iterate through each of those things and it can pull out item.find item.find name, give me the name thing and then find the text within that. So that's going to be Chuck. We can say item.find ID dot text and that will be the 001 bit and then item.getx, which will pull out item.getx will pull out that value right there. Let me draw that again. So item.find.name will get dirt. Let's give you a better picture. So item item is that item.find.name.text is Chuck. item.find.id.text is 001. And item.getx, that's find the attribute x on the item, the tag of what we're looking at, and that's going to get the two. So you're sort of looking at these things and pulling the bits out. You can, if there's more than one of them, you can write a for loop to go through them. Okay. So that's XML. I just, we're not going to do much with XML. We're going to do more with JSON. So that's one form of serializing data to move back and forth. Another is JavaScript object notation. So JavaScript object notation is, is a notation that it's really the constant syntax, the syntax to make JavaScript constants is what it turns out to be. It was named JSON by this fellow, uh, Douglas Crockford. And um, it is really exactly how you represent objects. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop now and have you take a look at the video from uh, Douglas Crockford. Okay?